Jigwich and welcome back to our study through the book of Genesis. We are studying, for those who might not be a part of the series, who might not have joined us before, through the entire Bible cover to cover. So we're not just taking random books and going through them. We are going from the first verse of Genesis to the final verse of Revelation, or at least that's the plan, or we'll, we'll see how far we get into it. Recently, what we started doing is taking, because it's all in, so far it's all been um, narratives, we've been taking clumps of narratives and taking one clump at a time and then breaking it down. So, for example, we did verses in chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, in a few messages. However, at the beginning of each message, because it's one narrative, I read the entire passage. It's the same thing we're going to be doing today. I plan to take uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, in a handful of messages. However, we're going to read the entire uh, seven verses in one go. Last time, we just did the first half of verse 1. Today, we're finishing verse 1. We won't be moving on to verse 2, though we will be looking a little bit at the rest of the passage. We're mainly focusing on the rest of verse 1. So, let's read it. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loin cloths. As I say, we're not going to be covering the entire narrative of verses 1 to 7 today. However, I hope you can appreciate why I decided to read the entire passage. As you can see, it is one connected uh, section of a larger passage. And it's important to understand that this verse and this part of this verse doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a particular context. The things before it and the things after it matter. And so I want you to keep everything in mind that I just read or... At least keep in mind that this does belong to a passage. It's not just one thing on its own. So I'm going to quickly go back over the first part of verse 1. We covered this last time. If you'd like more information on it, please go and look at that. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. We mentioned last time who this serpent was. It's the devil to some degree or another. Now, we can't be dogmatic about it. We can't say that this is definitely a real snake that has been possessed by the devil. We can't say that this is definitely the devil just happens to look like a snake. We can't say that this is definitely one thing or another in that particular regard. However, I think we can say pretty certainly that this is not just a regular snake that walked up to Eve and, say, and said, how would you like to sin today? I don't think that's what's going on. I believe this is the devil. And I mentioned last time, I believe this passage is almost making fun of the devil. The devil wanted to be exalted and have a high up name. And so he's not even named. He doesn't even get the credit for this. The devil was prideful. And so what's his great achievement here? He was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So yeah, that, that, that serpent guy, not even naming him. That serpent guy, I mean... Sure, he's smart, yeah, I mean, he's, he's smarter than the animals, I suppose. Basically making fun of him. And that will be important in a minute. I uh, will bring that back up in a minute. But just so you know, so you're caught up for now, that's mainly what we discussed last time. About this serpent and about the devil, and who the devil was. This time we're moving on, like I said, to the rest of the verse. He, that is the serpent or the devil, said to the woman, that is Eve, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. 
And of course, there's more to this and so on. The woman goes on um, and says, we may eat of the fruit and so on, but we're not covering that today. Something I want to mention is that I believe Adam was present for a good amount of this conversation. We go to verse 6, uh, about halfway through or a bit more through verse 6. She took of its fruit, that is Eve, took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. A lot of preachers, almost all of them seemingly, that I've listened to, have said that the order of events was that the serpent went up to Eve while she was alone, tempted her while she was alone, she ate alone, and then she went off and found her husband and convinced him to eat. So this whole time Eve is alone until she goes off to find Adam. That's not what the text says. At the very least, at the point in time when Eve eats the fruit, Adam is present. Adam was with her. And as well as that, that term you, that word you, you shall not eat, that word you is plural, talking to multiple people. Now, let's be clear. Before this, he said to the woman. The serpent is undeniably directing this at Eve in particular. This isn't directed at both of them. Eve is the focus of what the devil is doing here. And I don't want to can be confusing on that. I don't want to ignore that and say that he's talking to both of them. He's clearly not. He's directing this at Eve. However, the fact that later on it turns out that Adam was with her and the fact that the you is plural makes it seem like Adam was present for at least certain parts of this, possibly all of it. And that's what I believe happened. I believe Adam was here the whole time. So why isn't he mentioned before this? Well, I told you a minute ago that the devil is basically being mocked in this passage, saying, oh yeah, that guy, we won't name him, we'll just call him the serpent. I mean, he's smarter than the animals. Being mocked. I believe something similar is happening, happening here with Adam. Adam, I believe, was present in this story. But he was so insignificant to it that he could be left up to a footnote or something at the end going, oh yeah, Adam was there too and he ate. Now, Adam and Eve at this point are husband and wife. They're married. We don't know how long they've been in the garden. There's some debate about that. Uh, some people have said that the, the fall happened on the sixth day. So it was, you know, um, immediate. I don't believe that's true because then the next day God rested. I, don't, I, I think it would have had to be at least day eight or later. Others will say, oh, this was thousands of years later. This was you know, much, much later. I also don't believe that because they hadn't had children yet, it seems. Uh, it, it, I suppose you could possibly try and work the birth of Cain and Abel into this narrative and say that they were born just before they got kicked out or something. But the, I think a better reading of the text is that Cain and Abel and so on were born after the fall, after they'd been kicked out. So it seems that this happened somewhere between day seven and um, the birth of Cain and Abel. Uh, and as well as that, I think it's important to note that this would have happened, have to have happened, I think, late enough or later enough because at this point the devil almost certainly had fallen or this was a part of the fall there's no way i think that the devil did this and went back up to heaven like hey yeah we're all chill yeah don't, don't worry about it god that won't happen again i promise i don't think that happened either this was a part of the fall or it was after the fall of the devil now a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven at the fall of satan because a third of the angels had been on his side, a turn to his side. We don't know when the angels were created, however, it had to be at some st stage during the seven days, I believe, or during the six days, because God finished creation at the end of the sixth day. So, I believe that the, you know, the angels were created at some point during the six days. But it would have taken a bit of time, I think, for the devil to have rallied support and get a third of the angels on his side when you consider how many angels there were so i think that this event must have happened at least a few years after the creation event so adam and eve have been here for quite a while 
maybe even a few decades. But I don't believe it was centuries. I can't be dogmatic about this, but I would say they were probably only here or there um, a few years. And in that time, they'd likely seen many things. One thing they probably hadn't seen was a talking snake. And so people wonder, well, why was Eve not freaked out by this? Why was she not, you know, surprised or whatever? I believe that it's possible that she was. You see, this, look, this isn't a very natural interaction. The snake walks up and says, did God really say? And Eve just immediately turns around and starts engaging. That's not a very natural conversation. So it seems like the greater narrative was condensed for the sake of this, um, basically for the sake of just simplicity, it was condensed by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to really just get the point across. And so it's possible that the snake walked up and says hello to uh, Eve, and there's a bit of back and forth, basically explaining, yeah, I'm a snake, yeah, I can talk, so what? And then they get properly into it. Well, did God really say? And so on. So it's possible that Eve had some questions about how a snake could talk. And, so, and that was just left out for the sake of the narrative. It's also possible that she just accepted it. I mean, for example, she would have been around enough birds. She would have known of parrots and a few other species of birds that while they couldn't speak, they could imitate certain sounds, including words. And it's possible Adam and Eve would have mistaken this, or this um, copying for a very basic form of communication. And so it's possible that she thought, well, most forms of bird can't talk, but a handful can. Here's a talking serpent. I've never seen one before. Maybe most serpents can't talk, but this one can. And maybe Adam was there in the background, like, hold on a minute. I named this guy last week and he didn't say anything to me. What's going on? But anyway, it seems that it, it's possible Eve wouldn't have been too perturbed by this. Even if she was, it's possible that the devil simply cleared some things up that was left out before we get into this main conversation. And what is the main conversation? Well, it starts off in this narrative with, did God actually say? Or, as the King James famously puts it, hath God said? And that's, of course, something that people bring up, you know, hath God said? That's something that people will talk about a fair bit. And that's why that's the name of this message is hath God said? Because that's the question that the devil comes up to Adam and Eve with, but specifically directs it towards Eve and says, well, has God said? Hath God said? And you'll notice, by the way, what he immediately follows up with. You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. No, that's not what God said. That's completely different from what God said. Let's go to chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall eat, uh, or you shall have them for food. And then in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may sure to eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, God had been clear. Generally speaking, you can eat of anything. In terms of the garden, you can eat of anything with one exception. So the devil comes in and he says, well, hold on. Is it true that God has said you can't eat any of this stuff? He's being deceptive. Remember what um, the New Testament says. He was a liar and a murderer from the start. He's being deceptive and dishonest with his question. And he's saying, well, did God really say this? Well, no, he didn't. But he's sowing the seeds of doubt. Something interesting to note is that here we see three methods that are commonly used to this day to try and discredit the Bible. Here it's used to discredit the word of God as in one of his commandments. And in the modern day, it's used to discredit the word of God as in the Bible, though a lot of people will say it's not the word of God, and they're wrong about that. And so two of these three methods are found in verse 1, and the third one is found in verses 4 and 5. So first we see, did God actually say, or hath God said? In the modern day, the question is phrased, well, does the Bible really say this? Now, let's be very clear about this. Does the Bible actually say X, Y, and Z is a very valid question in and of itself. Whenever you're listening to preaching, whether it's me or your pastor or whoever, 
you always have to ask yourself, does the Bible actually say this? Or is this guy just giving us an interpretation based on an out of te uh, context verse that he's quote, um, quote mining and misusing? Does the Bible really say what this guy is saying it does? And that is not a bad question. That is not a dishonest question. That is not an immoral question in a general sense. And it is a very important question in Bible study. Here's my interpretation of the text. But is it really what the Bible says? Does the Bible really say this? That's an incredibly important question that we all must ask ourselves when reading the Bible and when interpreting it. We must say, does the Bible say this? For the sake of clarity, we ask this question so that we can know what God's word is and we can follow it and listen to it and believe it. But that's not what the serpent is doing. That's not what the devil is doing. Satan is doing something very different. He's not saying, is God really saying this or did God really say this so that he can make sure he has understood God. He can make sure he knows what's going on and make sure he can follow it. He is questioning whether or not God has said something, even being dishonest about what that thing is. He is questioning whether or not God has said something so he can plant the seeds of distrust in Eve's mind. And again, this is something we see a lot in the modern day. Someone will quote a Bible verse or quote a text or interpret a text and they'll do it right and they'll give a good interpretation and they'll say, someone else will say, does the Bible really say that? Does the Bible really teach that? Again, sometimes this is a genuine question. This is a fine question. <laughs> Listen to, if you ever, for whatever reason, put yourself through listening to Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland. The only question I ever find myself asking is, does the Bible actually say that? The answer is usually no. But sometimes the question is used in a way to discredit the word of God because people don't like it. The Bible says this thing is a sin. Oh, does it really? Does the Bible really? You see, if the Bible says that that's inconvenient to me because I like that sin, so does the Bible really say that? The Bible says that to be a pastor, you have to be a man. Oh, but does it really? Oh, that seems sexist. I'm a woman and I want to be a pastor, so that's inconvenient to me. So does it really say that? Well, yes, it does. Well, does it really? I'm going to think it doesn't because it suits me better. And that's what a lot of, by the way, a lot of so-called Bible study is. Read a passage that has a very clear meaning. But does it really mean that? Because if it does, that's personally inconvenient to me. I know. I'll ignore it. Or I'm purposefully misinterpret it to say something different. Hey, great. Now, the Bible can say whatever I want it to say. That's not how we do Bible texts. We have to ask the question, does the Bible really say? Not for our own sake, but for the sake of properly understanding the word of God. Not to question the Bible, but to ensure we understand it. The next type of thing that's often brought up against the Bible, again in verse 1. You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? No, he said no such thing. I read to you the verses before. You can eat anything in general, and in the garden you can eat anything except this one tree, except from this one tree. That's nowhere near what God said, not even close. And there is the second tactic. Lying about what's in the Bible, misrepresenting what's in the Bible. I'll give you an example of this. I once read an article that opened with the claim that the Old Testament of the Bible states that the Israelites were always a monotheistic religion, for they always followed mon monotheism. However, the archaeological record shows that they tended to be more polytheist. Therefore, the Bible is wrong because the Bible claims they were always monotheists. Here's the problem. The Bible claims... No such thing. So much of the Bible, in fact, so much of the Old Testament, of the prophets and so on, is dealing with the fact 
that every five minutes, the Israelites go off and start worshipping a false idol. If we go to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 12, My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. That's very clear. They keep to, they'll worship anything except God. That's the view we get in the Old Testament. Or the very famous story of the golden calf. Moses has gone up the mountain. He's only gone five minutes and the Israelites turn around to Aaron. We want a new God. We would like a new God. Make us a new God right now. Do it. And of course then Aaron, he, you know, he melts all the gold and so on. And he makes the calf. And then Moses comes back down the mountain. And Aaron, being the genius that he is, thinking on the spot, goes, Listen, Moses, pal, listen. You're never going to believe this. I lit the fire and the golden calf just walked out. It was amazing. You had to be there. But in all seriousness, that's one of the most famous stories of the Old Testament, or at least of the um, first five books of the Old Testament, is the story of the golden calf. So this idea of all the, the Bible says they were always perfectly monotheist, that's just a flat out lie. You don't even have to read the Bible. You just have some cultural knowledge of it and you will know that that's not true. And something I often see, by the way, is people going, you know, I, I, I've read the Bible. I know the Bible. I think you, you know the Bible. Yeah, I know the Bible. Oh, well, that's, that's amazing <laughs> to hear these atheists say, I know the Bible, particularly online. I think, well... I mean, there's people who've dedicated, they're in their 70s, they've dedicated the last 50 years of their life. That's half a century to understanding just parts of the Bible. And here you stand before me, 17 years of age, and you have it mastered. That's amazing. I need your skills, so I do. So I've read the Bible. Oh, have you now? They usually haven't. So many people, I've read the Bible. No, what you did is you watched a video on YouTube titled Top 10 Most Evil Bible Verses or something stupid like that made by some atheist YouTube channel and now you reckon you're an expert. That's so often what happens, by the way. So many people say, I've read the Bible. They haven't. Or if they have, they've just like skimmed through it or whatever. But they say, I know the Bible. Trust me, they probably don't. But... um. It's a lot of these same people who make these misleading claims, who make these false claims about what the Bible says. I know the Bible, and the Bible says, and then they will proceed to say something that the Bible doesn't say. And it happens so often, like the example I just gave you, of that guy who almost certainly believes he has a good knowledge of the Bible, claiming that the Israelites were always perfectly monotheistic. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, that is one of the most ridiculous claims you can imagine. Because half of the stories in the Old Testament, maybe being a bit hyperbolic, but yeah, I mean, half of the stories in the Old Testament are in some way related to the Jews going off and worshipping a false god. Even if you skim through some of the Old Testament, it's hard to miss. But that's just the tactic of some people. That's the tactic of the devil. Because if you don't believe in Christianity, you believe in a lie. And you cannot defend a lie with the truth. You can defend the truth with the truth. You can defend a lie with a lie. If you're very smart, you might even be able to defend the truth with a very clever lie. But you can never defend a lie with the truth. And so, in order to defend whatever position they have, they have to lie about what the Bible says. The Bible says what it says. If you want to know what it says, don't listen to someone who claims to know. Read it for yourself. And listen to good godly preaching. Don't, let me be clear, don't go off and just read it for yourself. I don't need a church, I don't need, I'll just read it and come to my own conclusions. Don't do that, that's a very bad idea. But read the people who come before you, read the church fathers, read the reformers, read all of these amazing people of the faith. Find a good godly church if you want to know what the Bible says. Don't listen to some random teenager on the internet who's almost certainly never even seen a Bible in real life 
and trust that he knows what he's talking about. I promise you, he doesn't. I'm going to read on now, verses 2 to 5, and then we will see the third tactic that is often used against the Bible. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. So, so far, so good. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. God said no such thing. I'm not going to go into it now. I'm springing up. God did not say you couldn't touch the tree. But Satan, he knows is this. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't correct her. Because it's helpful to him. More on that when we get to verse 3. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Eve says something that's true and something that's false. And the devil corrects. Not the part that's false, but the part that's true. Because that's who he is. He's dishonest. And so here we get to the third thing, which is that the Bible is wrong or the word of God is wrong. So, so far we've had, well, yes, it's true, but does it say that? Or well, maybe not, yes, it's true, but we've just had, does it say that? Are you sure it says that? The second thing is, here's something it says, which it doesn't. And the third thing is, okay, we're in agreement on what the Bible says. We accept that what the Bible says, you know, that's what it says. I don't doubt that that's what the Bible says. But the Bible is wrong. That's incorrect. Hath God said? Oh, he has? Okay, cool. He's wrong. And this is something we see so often in so-called Bible scholarship. And I struggle to call it scholarship because it's a joke. It really is. I genuinely believe if these people were to treat any other work throughout history the way they treat the Bible, they'd be laughed out of academia. It's ridiculous. But people are so biased against the Bible that they'll do anything to try and disprove it. Including just taking claims and going, ah, that's, that's wrong. For example, for the longest time, we had no evidence of Pontius Pilate existing. However, we found evidence that he did in the end. We found evidence that Pontius Pilate was a real person. That's just one example. So, in conclusion... The Bible is real. The Bible is trusted. Uh, you, you can trust the Bible. The Bible says you are a sinner, but that God forgives sinners. The Bible says that if you repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven. And that that is the only way you can be forgiven. The Bible is the word of God. It can be trusted. So trust it. Repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ.